Chairman, and I appreciate your holding this hearing. It's another good opportunity for us to take a broader view here. We've talked about military, soft power, trade tools, um, so much to do with regard to China. I, I will, if it's okay, uh, ask a question in a moment about the Confucius Institutes. And, and Chairman's right, we had an eight-month investigation and found some disturbing things about lack of reciprocity and lack of transparency uh, that I wanna, I wanna touch on with, with you, Mr. Talent. Uh, thanks to both of you and Jim for your service on the commission over the years. Um, just quickly on the, on the trade issues in WTO, a lot of good um, points made this morning by Senator Romney, uh, Senator Cardin, and others. China has wanted to get out of non-market um, uh, status for a long time. As you know, we have been the ones that have pushed back. We have to continue to push back. Uh, they are a non-market economy. They still, unfortunately, under this new administration in China, they have even more focus on their state-owned enterprises. And we also have to deal with this issue of self-certifying on developing status. Uh, because of this growing uh, economy that they have, they're taking advantage of what developing countries, truly developing countries, uh, are, are able to use in the WTO system. And so there are things that can be done, as you say, even within the system. The nullification would require us to get the EU and Japan strongly on board. Uh, they have reason to do that, and I agree with you. Uh, that we need to be more multilateral in how we approach it. But I will say this administration has done the right thing, in my view, with regard to the 301 case. As tough as it is for some of my Ohio farmers and, and manufacturers and, and others, and I hope, we all have to hope, that by the next few weeks we'll have some, some good news coming out of those negotiations. If so, we will, for the first time, have dealt with some of the structural issues. Um, you're right, we need to use our own tools more. We have a 269% tariff in place on, on rolled steel from China right now is an example because we did pass legislation here three years ago. We're now using much more aggressively to go after dumping and subsidization, but it's way broader than that. And, it, and intellectual property obviously is the focus of the 301. On the Confucius Institutes, just quickly, what we found out was $158 million has gone from the Chinese government into these Confucius Institutes uh, over the last uh, half dozen years. And it's amazing to me that um, you know, we don't hear more from the academy on this because you've got about 100 colleges and universities that have Confucius Institutes now, and they come with strings attached. And I think those strings can compromise academic freedom. I don't know if you've looked into this much, but any thoughts you had on that, Jim, would be appreciated. Uh, the Chinese government vets and approves all the Chinese directors, the teachers, the events themselves, the research proposals, the speakers at Confucius Institutes. Uh, Chinese teachers also sign contracts with the Chinese government, saying that they will follow Chinese law and conscientiously safeguard China's national interests. Uh, any thoughts on Confucius Institutes? Yeah, and the influence goes beyond just the Confucius Institutes because the influence of the money, uh, the participation, it, it, it's causing scholars in the field, uh, in some cases to, you know, to self-censor, to be very careful about what they say uh, because they won't have access to grants, they won't be able to travel to China as they, as they need to. It's a real problem. Um, I, I would encourage you even to broader the, broaden the approach and look at, at the work of the United Front Work Department, which is in charge of the Confucius Institutes. It's, it's I think, the, one of the oldest organs uh, created by the Chinese Communist Party. Uh, they've hired tens of thousands of new cadres or employees under Xi Jinping. Uh, this whole concept and, uh, of smart, uh, not smart, sharp power. You know, we're used to soft, Power, smart power, hard power, sharp power is, is uh, gray war tactics that they use extremely effectively to disrupt, confuse the narrative in other countries. And they're doing it through higher ed. I do think you know, we, we, we should not view the higher academy as like our higher academy is the enemy in this. I mean, they've, they've, they didn't know what was going on any more than many other people did. But um, yeah, there's a broader narrative and um, I think it's important that the committee become aware of the facts. And again, this is an area where we have to develop tools for countering effectively. Yeah, one, of, one of the tools, Dr. Mesh, I want to hear from you, that we've tried to develop is to have our own ability to have a presence in Chinese universities, colleges, educational system. Uh, we have failed in that because we have been blocked from doing that. That's the reciprocity concern. Mm -hmm. that while you have a growth of Confucius Institutes, by the way, there are also about 1,000 K through 12 institutions that have Confucius Institutes, primarily focused on Chinese language, as I understand it. We focus more on the colleges and universities, but it also is K through 12. We can't do that in China. In fact, we're pulling back. As of this summer, we will have no U.S. State Department presence uh, in terms of our own American values and history being taught in China. Dr. Mastro. 
So I think these Confucius Institutes, and in general, the, um, uh, the uh, department uh, that was previously mentioned is extremely entrepreneurial in that China does, they combined covert operations with public diplomacy, which is something that the United States doesn't do. Um, and this is why they have been able to really have such an influence on, um, I think, academic discussion to a degree and also instruction because the main goal of this funding is to shape the conversation about China to ensure that people aren't saying things about China in the United States and other countries. This is a big issue about political interference that goes against what the party wants people to say. Um, I don't think, bottom line, it's bad to take any money from the PRC. To tell universities, you know, you that there might be a big funder that comes from China and so you shouldn't uh, engage with them. That might not be the right approach, but there needs to be s serious constraints on the amount of influence uh, that uh, China can have so it doesn't restrict academic freedom. For example, universities should be able to choose their own instructors uh, for these institutes. If they then, like with other donors, want to say, and we thank the People's Republic of China for their donation for this, that's fine. But this level of control and the lack of reciprocity is a real issue. I myself have spent time in Beijing studying and the amount to which you know the foreigners have to be kept separately at that time, I can't confirm now, but at that time it was not, it was illegal for me to enter a dormitory to engage with Chinese students. Um, so I think the United States needs to demand much more of this reciprocity. Yeah. And Chinese um, monitors at all those institutions. My, my time's expired and I apologize. On the transparency issue, just so you know, it's not so much the fact that these schools are accepting the funding, it's that they aren't reporting it. And in fact, we think that about 70% of the schools are out of compliance with our own U.S. Department of Education rules on that. So at a minimum, we should have reciprocity and transparency so people know what's going on. Yes. Thank Great. you, Mr. Chairman.